we get to take in some new members. And so it's always exciting when we get to, to be able to do that, to expand uh, Christ's kingdom. And so today, um, this will be our last Clean Your Garage sermon. Uh, you guys know I, I have a children's church background and a youth pastor background, so I really enjoy using objects. Um, I've done a lot of uh, um, research on how human beings learn, and frankly, the worst way, if you wanted to, to find a way, what's the worst way that you can teach people a, a concept? Lecture is the worst way. That's the worst way we learn. And we learn more with objects and we, we learn more with uh, doing. We learn more by doing. And so uh, I, like to, I like to have objects. And so we've been talking about cleaning your, out your garage. And we all have stuff cluttering up our garages. And inside of our hearts and minds, it's the same thing. We have all kinds of things cluttering up our hearts and our minds. And honestly, there's, there's some times where we need to just get in and clear the clutter out. And we need to get some of those things that we are unorganized with. We talked about last week, our time is something that we're just so unorganized with. And our finances is that way. And so sometimes we need to get to put all those things in their compartments in their proper place and be organized. And today I have the boat. I have a boat here. with. Actually, I wanted a kayak or a canoe, but um, this, this will have to suffice. And, um, and no, I cannot wear this the whole time. I'm already starting to sweat, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry. But anyway, you have a, a, a kayak here, but I remember in the canoes, uh, when we were at church camp and one of my favorite things to do, uh, me and, and a friend of mine, Jeff Clemens, we'd like to go out there on the canoe and you'd think we want to go out there to fish. No, we wanted to go out there and take our paddles and splash all of the other fellow canoeer people, right? And yes, typically they were mostly girls, and, and so we would go out there, and everything was just fine when we would work together, right? When we would work together. But there were those, those times, and I guess it was mostly me, because I guess I'm a little bit more of an impulsive person, but sometimes I would see an opportunity to really get somebody wet, and I would go my own way, and before you know it, we're tipping over in the canoe. <laughs> and uh, one of my favorite stories, I told this 5,000 times, so this will be 5,001. We tipped over in the canoe, and of course we had our life jackets on, and so the water was warm. I'm, I'm just out there backstroking. I'm just having a good old time out there. But Jeff, he was concerned about the canoe because it was sinking. And so he's out there, he's, his life jacket's coming off, and he's trying to hold the canoe. He is literally getting worried. And I can see it in his face. And he's like, and he was upset at me. I'm over there just having a good little time swimming around. He's trying to hold this up. He's like, what are you doing on his eyes sides? I said, Jeff, stand up. We were in three foot of water <laughs> the whole time, the whole time. But see, when we were rowing together, when we were splashing together, everything went fine. But it's when we, were, when we decided to go our own way or when we decided to row in a different direction, we would always get hung up. And so I want you to remember that object lesson as we go through today's sermon. We had a new membership class. And so all of the folks who are going to come up here uh, to become a, a new member have gone through this class with us and they read this book by Tom Rayner. And the name of the book is, I Am a Church Member. And so one of the things that I really appreciated about, about these, these folks, and, and, I, and I'm going to ask the same for you, is can we just speak plainly here, right? Can, can we just say the words that we know need to be said, and sometimes they aren't said because we're kind of afraid about somebody taking offense, and, and whatever is being said here today isn't directed at our local church. It isn't directed at anybody in particular, but I'm going to ask that you allow me to have some grace and just kind of speak the way that we, we spoke in these classes so that we're all on the same page, rowing together, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. And we know that a church is in trouble when we have some people over here doing this thing and some people over here doing this thing and some people over there doing that thing. We need to be rowing together. We need to have one mind and one purpose with one love 
because we serve one God together. And so I'm going to ask that your indulgence for this for me today, but we're going to, I'm going to kind of preach upon what we've gone over in this book so that we're all on the same page. So with all of that being said, I'm going to ask Crystal if you would stand and say a prayer for us before we get into this. Amen. Amen. So, uh, throughout you'll see every once in a while, I am a church member. And the, the topic of this one will be, um, and it was like the first chapter of the book. And it, it said, I will be a functioning member. I will be a functioning member. See, the Bible explains membership differently than, than what secular culture sets up membership as. Tom Rainer says, with the country club membership, you pay others to do the work for you. With church membership, everyone has a role, everyone has a purpose, everyone has a function. Many times throughout Scripture, when God is speaking through Paul as far as church membership goes, he uses the, the, the human body as a metaphor, as a metaphor, and so um, this first passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 14, is an example of that. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So we understand the human body is one body, but we also understand there are many parts to this body. Paul also says in Romans chapter 4, or chapter 12, verse 4 through 5, For just as each one of us has one body with many members, and those members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. If you are a believer in Christ, if you are a Christian, you belong to the body of believers as a whole, right? And so when we, we're taking our members up here to be a member of this local, this, uh, local uh, body of believers, they are a part of the larger body of believers in Christ, right? Christ's kingdom. So we all understand that, right? And so we all understand that there are many, many, many different parts of this body. But not all of the parts are the same. We have different body parts that do different things. And so I think this is something that we all understand. But one of the things that we forget sometimes is that each part of the body has a function. Each part of the body has a specific purpose. And so maybe some of us, we don't know what that is as a, as a part of this local body. We don't know what that is. But let me tell you, it is scripturally sound that God has created you with certain gifts. God has given you certain gifts with His Spirit. He has given you tools that you can use for His service. And I've, I have learned many times that it's often in the serving, just finding a gap somewhere, fill the gap, that it's in that when the Lord shows me my purpose. And so it's not, the, it's not this picture sometimes that I think young people get, those that wait on the Lord. They have this picture of this giant comfy couch with this big TV, and I'm going to sit on this couch, and I'm going to prop my feet up, and I'm going to sit here and wait until the Lord tells me what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> but that's the wrong imagery of wait, those that wait. That actual word means to serve, 
like as in a waitress or a waiter. Those that serve the Lord, those that get up and find a gap and fill it, those that serve will find strength and, and will mount up wings as, as an eagle. Those that serve will find their purpose, will find their role. They'll find that the, the Lord opens all of the doors for them to walk through. That's, that's my story. I, I, uh, I never knew what the Lord was going to have me do. And so I just knew I'm just going to serve the Lord. And along the way, he just opened this door and then he opened this door and he opened this door. And I find myself where I'm at because the Lord brought me here. I just followed him. And so maybe some of you are waiting for the big cosmic skies to roll back and, uh, and, to, ha and to be caught up in, into the, uh, the third heaven. And maybe you're waiting for that experience. But let me tell you, the Lord doesn't always work that way. He did it that way for Saul. But he doesn't promise to do that for everyone. His word, though, says to serve. And we know this because what is explicitly implied throughout all of these body references is that each member of the body is supposed to function. We get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, there would, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has, a, has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. So we have here, He talked about the foot, the hand, the ear, the eye, and the nose talks about the sense of smell. And so we know that each of these particular parts have a function. And so Paul is, is, is explicitly implying here that if you're a, a member in the body of believers, you have a function. You have a purpose. But I think what he was trying to tell to the, the church in Corinth here is that where things break down is when you want to do something that's not part of the purpose that God has placed you in. Or if you have been put in a place to operate and to function and you simply just don't, that's when things start to break down. But verse 18 says, but in fact, God has placed the body, the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So sometimes when we, it's, it's almost a sense of false humility, if I could say that bluntly, when we say, I'm no good, I can't do anything. That's, I say that's false humility because God created you. He created you with a purpose. And so you're, you're placing doubt, really, not, not so much on, on yourself. You're not putting yourself you're putting God down. You're putting God down. You're, what you're, you're declaring unfaith. When we say that, we're declaring unfaith in God, if that is such a word. I don't know. We're going to use it today. I'm declaring unfaith in God when I say, I don't have a purpose. I'm no good. I have no talent. That's no faith in God. You're not trusting Him. He created you. He has a purpose for you. He knows you by name when He laid the foundations of this world. He knew you by name and He gave you a purpose. Operate in that purpose. And if you don't know what that purpose is, find a hole, fill in the gap, and the Lord will reveal that to you. Tom Rainier goes on to say, do you know how to remain a member of a country club? Pay your dues. Do that and people will be available to serve you. But do you know how to remain a biblical member of church? Give abundantly and serve without hesitation. That's what it means to be a member of the body of believers. If you are a church member, 
You must be a functioning member. Tom Rainer says, it's just that simple. <laughs> it's just that simple. 1 Corinthians 12 and 26 says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Every member has a function. Every member has a purpose. So that's the first topic that we covered in our class is that, and they made the pledge and, and they said, and let this be so also in us who are members today. I will be a functioning member. The next one is so important. All of these are. So that's kind of stupid to say. This is so important. You know, the next one, this is so important. <laughs> Just say that. Just say that on all of them, okay? I will be a unifying church member. We know, I don't have this verse for you, CJ, so don't look for it, but we know that a, a, a hallmark of a disciple of God, a, a, a characteristic trait of a child of God is laid out in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. So we know that this is a hallmark or a characteristic trait of a believer of a disciple of Christ. This isn't necessarily a characteristic trait of a church member. This should be a characteristic trait of any believer in Christ, any disciple of Christ. Jesus says this in John chapter 13, verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, by this. Not because you have a grand building, not because you have great programs, not because you have a lot of money, not because you have a great service, not because you have great musicians. They will know you by this if you love one another. All the other stuff is just shiny stuff, right? It's great. Don't get me wrong. I love it. We need it. We'll do it. But it's by our love for one another that people will know that we are his disciples. We talked about this at the call to worship. You can't watch the news today. You can't, I, I just the other day, it was a couple months ago, but I, I saw somebody open the door for somebody at Quick Trip and that person cussed him out because he opened the door for him. We're, that's, we all know that. We get outside, it's covered in it. It's like this heavy cloak of hate and darkness. Not so for us as believers, not so. We will not repay evil with evil. We will repay evil with good. We will repay evil with love. Why? Because by this, everyone will know you are my disciples, Jesus said. If you love one another. We must be unifiers. We've heard all of the stories about ugly business meetings at church. All right? I think the Lord, I haven't heard one of those here. All right, so let's keep it that way, by the way. But anyway, we've heard about all of the ugly stories of business meetings at church. Do you think an outsider would have been impressed with some of this Christian behavior that they witnessed? Paul says a lot about unity. Unity in love. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 and through 16, he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love, for all God's people. Let it be so of this church. Let it be so of this church. We may not be the richest. We may not be the biggest. But let everybody know this is a church that loves all of God's people. Those who are lost and those who are found. We love them all. I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers. He continues in Ephesians chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity. Make every effort to keep the unity. As a part of being a member of the body of believers, our responsibilities is that we are to be a source of unity. We are never 
Never, ever. We should never be a source of division. Never. If we are a source of division, we are not operating on our Lord's business. We're not operating in that manner because we know the Lord is not a divider. God is love. God is for unity. And this doesn't mean, by the way, okay, this doesn't mean that we're going to agree on 100% of everything 100% of the time. Right? Can, we, can I get an amen on that one? It doesn't mean that I'm saying we all have to agree. But it does mean that we are willing to sacrifice our own preferences to keep unity in the church. Colossians 3 and 12 says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There's no room for self in all of that. There's a popular thing a few years ago on t-shirts and stuff like that, and there's a, a book series in it, and it says, I am second. And I like the premise because it, it means that the Lord must be first in our life. It means that the Lord must be number one. But when you read Scripture here, you can't help but, but learn that, that that phrase is not entirely accurate. If we wanted to follow the Lord through every single letter of His Word to us, we should be wearing shirts that don't say, I am second. We should be wearing shirts that say, I am last. I am last. But I get it. I know there are some of our brothers and sisters who don't know the difference between preference and need. Right? I'm not saying don't come to church hurt. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying don't come to church with your problems. I'm not saying that. We're supposed to be there to bear one another's burdens. We're supposed to be there to lift each other up in prayer and to cover each other in prayer and to be there and step in the gap. If you have a need, you have a body of believers here to step into that gap and meet that need with you. I'm not talking about our needs and I'm not talking about our troubles and I'm not talking about our sorrows. I'm talking about our preferences. And we'll get to that in another section. I don't want to get too far off the rails on that. But we know in unity, there are fewer things that can destroy unity more, more complete than gossip and unforgiveness. If you want to destroy the unity of the church, get involved with some of the gossip. And we know church people can be involved with gossip just as much, if not more and better, than people who are not saved, right? We know that. I know that. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. And I don't think I have this verse for you, CJ, but in Romans chapter 1, and if you read that, it's, it's kind of a depressing chapter, really. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of ugliness in that chapter. But Paul gets really to the brunt of the matter, and you know he he doesn't lick to the center of the tootsie roll pop. He gets right, he bites right into it. But in verses twenty nine through thirty one, there's a there's a huge list of unrighteous acts, and right there in the middle of all of those horrible things is gossip. First Peter three, eight through twelve. The Lord tells us, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. That's always a hard one for me, by the way. And that's, I'm just, if Scott's involved, Scott has a comeback. And you, you, if you come at me, I got to come back, you know. So this, this, this kind of steps on my toes a little bit. And so, sorry, Lord. Help me, Lord. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil. Oh, Lord, help me with that. And their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. 
For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and the ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Love life. See good days. Control our tongue. Stop the gossip. Be a unifier. There's one thing that we can all do together. When we get start rowing together in the canoe, where we have one mission, the, Jesus said, I came so that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is our mission. That is what He has us to do. That is what the church is to be doing. If we are to row the same direction at the same time, let's together, let's together work on this and squash the gossip. Squash it. It's so easy to get involved into that. All it takes is someone to say something and you're like, yeah, you know what? I agree with you. And we, that is the, the one thing that will create division in our church. And let's not play that role. There are ways to handle this and they're laid down in Scripture. Go to that person. Talk to that person. But, but by all means, don't gossip. Pray, pray, pray. Be a unifier. Forgive one another. Do I have Colossians chapter 3? CJ next? Yes. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, and humility. You guys see a pattern here? He's saying this to all of the churches. All right, this is, you find this in all of the letters to the churches. Here's a message to us, our church, to our church members today. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience bear with each other forgive one another if any of you has grievance against someone forgive as the lord has forgiven you one of the number one reasons why people live leave the church is because a church member hurt them through something that they said we're going to say stupid things i promise you i'm going to say some stupid things And I would bet you may have said some stupid things too. So let's forgive one another. Let's, we're going in the same direction. We're rowing in the same direction. We all want to be more like Christ. We all want to share the gospel of Christ to, to our loved ones. Everybody was up here. They have lost loved ones. We all want our lost loved ones to be, to be sent to Christ or have Christ reach out to them and grab them. We all want that. That is our purpose. So let's row in that direction. And when one of us says something stupid, when one of us does something stupid, maybe we need to tell them about it, but let's forgive and let's pray and let's love going in the same direction. So one of the things is I am a church member. One of the pledges that our new members have made, and let it be so also in us, is that I will be a unifying member. I will be a unifying member. The next one. This one's kind of this one's kind of rough to get through, right? So we talked about how we can speak plainly here, right? <laughs> so let's let's do it. Be praying for me, please. This was a chapter. So this is Tom. So if you're upset at anybody, be upset at Tom. Not me, right? This is another pledge that our new members made. Let it also be so in us. I am a church member. I will not let my church be about my preferences and my desires. It's a harsh one. It's a harsh one. Remember I said how some of, some of our brothers and sisters can't tell the difference between my preferences and my needs? That's what this one here is all about. And we see this in, even in the disciples, right? How many times have they gotten into this me first arguments? I'm going to be sitting on the right hand of Jesus. No, I'm going to be sitting at the right hand of Jesus. And so Jesus takes all of his disciples in the middle of one of their me first arguments. They're like children, right? We forget that these were grown men. No, they were like children. I'm first. No, I'm first. No, I'm first. So Jesus takes them, sits them down in Mark chapter 9, verse 35, and says this to them. And I would say he's saying this to us, any would-be disciple of Christ. Jesus is saying this to you. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. That's not a very popular message. <laughs> not, 
Not a very, you know, if, it, we, if somebody out there in the community, if they wanted to have, there's one step that you can have to have joy in your life. If there's one step you can take in your life that will take you out of your depression or heal your mental illnesses or heal your family hurt and all of that, people would be clamoring. What's the one thing that sounds so easy? What's the one thing? Be a servant. Be a slave to Christ. Be his servant. Whew. How many of us would say, nah, I'm sorry, that message was for Tom, not for me. But see, the word servant occurs 57 times in the New Testament. The word serve occurs 58 times in the New Testament. Don't you think that serving is an important concept to our Heavenly Father? Yes, it is. And we've heard of all kinds of the horror stories about churches splitting because of the color of the carpet. We've, we've heard those stories. We need to follow Jesus, not the world. And he takes everything, our, our, what we think is knowledge, things that we're solid, we think we know. Jesus takes that and flips it upside down. And there's this paradoxical thing that occurs in us. We think one thing that would make me happy is to be selfish and go do the things that make me happy. But not so. We will never find joy, true joy, in church membership when we are constantly seeking things our way. Tom Rainer, this, this is kind of his thing. He's about church membership. He's about churches. He, he goes around and he, he sees churches when they're um, declining. And he, he's like a consultant. What can we do to, to help these churches? And so they go, they've gone around across the nation and done surveys and all kinds of church memberships and stuff like that. And he says, here's the top indicators, top indicators of church members who are inwardly focused. Are you ready for this? Top one. Number one, and I think we all know what, what it's going to be, right? Worship wars. And the number one thing that divides churches today between old and young and, and all of that stuff is the type of worship music. Remember, you can be mad at Tom. You can write him a strongly worded letter. But we know this is true, right? We know this is true. See, when we come here to this house of worship, we're supposed to be here for one another, and we're supposed to be here to lift His name up. But what are we doing when we come here and expect a certain music or certain preferences? We're putting ourselves in front of everyone else, and we're putting ourselves up in front of the Lord. We're supposed to be here to worship Him. It's about the words. It's about the Spirit. It's not about the music, right? And I know I was one, I, I still am, I'm sorry. I said was, I'm trying, I know. I am one of the worst ones about this. Sometimes when he, when we play a slow song, I whine like an ambulance. Wah! So I'm speaking to myself. If this doesn't apply to you, then let me just say this for myself. Number two indicator of inwardly focused church members. A greater concern about change than about the gospel. Okay, so, so many churches, uh, uh, he, he used some examples about how somebody, they needed to reuse or rethink or reorganize a certain room in the church, but it's been one way for so long and it created a huge division in the church, right? So these, these kinds of examples where we are more concerned about change to my routine, to my setup, to my Sunday ritual than we are about sharing the gospel with those who need to hear it. This is a, a mark of an inwardly focused church member. Three, which I think is kind of related, but he's, they, they, they termed it evangelistic apathy. In other words, they're consistently more concerned about their own needs, their own preferences, than they are about sharing their own faith. 
And I, say, I shared some statistics about our church here in America where there was only 2%, 2% of the people of, who are regular attenders of church regularly share their faith with others. May that not be so in us. So when we find ourselves in this situation where we are focused on me, myself, and I, you're in the your preference zone. Right? You're in the twilight zone. <laughs> Let these be indicators for ourselves. But we are to have the mindset of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8, says this. In your relationships with one another... All right, so here's, here's the thing Paul's saying to us. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. We all know in this world how certain things work. If you're related to a certain special somebody, you get special perks and special privileges. If you are a brother of, a, of, of Patrick Mahomes, I don't know if he has any brothers, I don't know. I'm just using this as an example. If you're a brother of Patrick Mahomes, then you're going to be able to get Patrick Mahomes to come and, and speak at your church and do certain things, right? You have certain perks. But Jesus, who is, who is God, did not think to use that position to advance his own wants, his own desires, to his own advantage. Verse 7, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Verse 8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Paul saying, we should be like Jesus. This is who we're supposed to be. A servant. He emptied himself, humbled himself, was obedient to the point of death. It's not any different for us as a church member. As a church member. And so how, when you read Philippians chapter 2, how when you read those verses, could we sit there and honestly expect that every worship song needs to be the way I like it? I will not let my church be about my preferences and my desires. So if we, church, if we approach church membership from the perspective of entitlement, we have it upside down. That's the way the world treats membership. That's the way secular culture treats membership. We need to ask, what can I do to help advance Christ's mission to the church in my church? then you will have discovered the joy of being last. Being last. The last one. So I'm about done. And this one, this chapter is a bit kind of self-serving, I'll admit, but it's so important, and I kind of changed it a little bit. And the book is, I will be a member who prays for my pastor. Right? But we know that there are more leaders and more people in this church who need your prayers. And so beyond that, I ask, I believe Scripture bears this out, that I will be a member, a church member who prays. One of the, the first things that Tom Rainier, when he goes to a church that's in decline, the first thing he asks those group of people is, what is your prayer life like? That is the first question he asks. And we know that Pastor John, he believed in the power of prayer. He was constantly having his church sign up for 24 hours of prayer for this community. So he knew what prayer meant. Because he knows what prayer means to the Lord. He knows what good, clean communication to our Father is all about. So if you're going to be a church member, part of the functioning role is to be a member who prays. I pray. I made this promise to you earlier and I'm going to continue to keep this promise. I'm going to mess up. We have CJ, our, our youth pastor. He's going to mess up. Sorry, CJ. <laughs> I know it's not a very uplifting message. Right? <laughs> Savannah, our children's pastor. 
She's not going to do everything perfect, everything right. We need grace. We need love. We need understanding. We need your prayers. We need your prayers. It's part of the whole gossip thing, right? So one of the things we can battle gossip is like, can you believe Scott said this, such and such? Yeah, you know, he's a hillbilly. I know that. But you know what he needs more than, than you backbiting is your prayer. That's how we help, help one another, right? I asked if I could speak plainly. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. It says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. If a church member is, that is not functioning, Tom Rainier says, is an oxymoron. To be a biblical member of the church, you will be a functioning member you will be a unifying member. You will not make church about you. And you'll be praying for all the people. James 5 and 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. If I've done something wrong, I want to be told. <laughs> I want to be, I don't want, I don't want to continue to mess up. And one of the things that you, you have in me and, and CJ and Savannah and Rick and all of our teachers and, and the people who are on this board is you have people here who will fight to the death for you. And we love you. And we'll do anything for you. So if I mess up, it's not because I purposefully want to hurt you. And I don't want to keep doing that. So come talk to me. Don't, don't go tell brother and so-and-so, you know, how, how stupid he is because he doesn't even realize this. Just come to me and talk and pray for me and we can work anything out. And, and if, if your problem isn't with me, but... You know, the people over here I sit on this side of the church think the people over here aren't singing loud enough. You know what I'm saying. We love one another and we forgive one another and we'll pray for one another and be there for one another. So in lieu of our, our uh, altar time, I thought what would be kind of fun, maybe you would not agree with this, and it's not about being a member of this local body of believers. It's about being a believer in Christ. And, and, a, and a couple uh, months ago, we were going through the book of Joshua, and they had that, that moment where they were reading from the book of the law, and they had everybody stand, and after each blessing and after each curse, they would have the congregation shout, Amen. Now, one of the things I want to, to talk about the word amen before we get going, you know, Brother Rick, he's going to have a, a Wednesday class about words and, and what have you. And so when I filled in, I talked about some of the words we use. Maybe we don't know what they mean. And, and for a lot of us, when we're young, amen is one of those words. We think that amen is one of those things where we let the know, Lord know we're done praying, right? That's that we're, Our communication is now done. But amen actually means, let it be so, that I'm going to put everything I got into me, or it, that I got in me, to see this happen, to support this. And so if it's not something you want to do, let me encourage you to not say amen. A couple times ago, Crystal said, I'm going to pray that the Lord puts us on an adventure. I did not say amen to that. <laughs> Except for when I went to go pray, yes, Lord, put her on an adventure. No. So we're going to have a list, our little, our little congregational moment. For if you're a believer in Christ, there's some things that the Lord tells us to do. And a little hint, we used it for our call to worship. <laughs> and so I'm going to have you stand with me, if you will. We're going to read these. And if this is something you believe, if you're a believer in Christ, and this is something that you want to pull your fort, put your full effort behind to see it through, Say amen. Say amen. Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Amen. amen. Needed to be a little bit more hearty. 
right? Because I'm going to be honest with you, this is going to be hard to do. <laughs> this is going to be hard to do, and if, we're, if we have wimpy amens, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Put some, put some <clears throat> into it. I say oomph a lot, so you might hear that. We need some oomph behind our amen. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Amen. Amen. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Amen. Amen. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Amen. Be careful. I think we need to focus on that a little bit more. Because I think some of us are, um, I don't know, I'm trying to make up a word here in, in the moment and it's not going to work for me, but you've heard of the term bulls in a china shop, right? Or a china store. That's, that's what I am. If you ask me to come help you move, just know I'm going to break something. I'm sorry, I'm doing my best, but you know, I'm not graceful. And so some of us, I think we're, we're that way with grace, right? We have permission, we can live by grace. So we're like bulls in a china shop. But we're, the, the word tells us to be careful. Be, be careful with how we live. Be careful with how we interact with people. Yes, it may be something you don't struggle with. Somebody else does. Let's be careful with it. And let's not just stomp on people because I have the grace to do so. Does that make sense? Yes, yes okay. Um, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. Amen. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Amen. That's also kind of a self-serving thing, right? When I'm reading that, it's like, I, I don't know. We have to be careful because I know myself, and I'm just going to be honest with Scott. I, sometimes I can tell myself, yeah, I'm going to be nice to you because the Lord's going to get you. <laughs> right? I don't know that that's necessarily what he's talking about. <laughs> Let's just be graceful and love for one another because, you know, I don't do everything right either. So I, I, if somebody messes up, I mess up too. So I'm going to forgive them. And, and you know what I'm saying. All right. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Is that the last one? I'm sorry, that was kind of anticlimactic. Yes. Amen. 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 Let's not just be hearers of God's word only, but let's be doers as well. Let's pray.